ain't no black in the Union Jack. This has always been a stick used by racists and those of the far right to figuratively beat Britain's growing black population with. The idea was quite a simple yet biting one. This was a land for European Christians, with the system ingraining that privilege at every turn. But Britain's sizable black minority had something to say about that, and they've been vocal since growing numbers started making the old empire their home in the aftermath of the devastating Great War. Britain, finding its population decimated, needed workers. The old colonial power became a go-to destination, alongside the United States of America and Canada, for thousands from the Caribbean, Africa, and the subcontinent. My family from Jamaica were one of the many who made the voyage and up sticks to come to this new world of supposed opportunity. The story of my family was not unique others came. And they came. People like Augustine John, who had already had family living in England, now a respected professor in the field of education and an outspoken critic of racism and injustice, the early years in Britain left their mark. Brits would be oblivious to the fact that for those outside the motherland, the UK was its epicenter. I couldn't help but in the sense that pretty much everything we taught, we were taught at school, was about England. Um, what people in this country particularly fail to realize is that those of us coming from these former colonies had a life experience with Britain in those colonies before we came to have a life experience in Britain here. And that meant you existed under a colonial government. Uh, what you learned in school, the curriculum was shaped according to um, English norms. Um, we studied English literature. I discovered, for example, literature written by Caribbean writers like Andrew Salkey and George Lamming and Olive Senior, Sylvia Winter and those people only when I came to this country. Um, and the church, um, affairs of state, pr pretty much everything reflected Britain. It was giving a view of Britain, which in many ways was artificial. I mean, when I came here, for example, the, the thought that there were working class white people who were poor and destitute was the biggest shock of my life. Um, the, the thought that there were white prostitutes, the thought that there were white people who were burglars and thieves and, and went to jail. I mean, you, you never got a sense back there that um, that is how humanity was constructed in England, you know. The lore of reuniting family who had already made the journey proved strong. Irene Sinclair, born on September the 23rd, 1908 in Guyana, made the trip from her island home to join her daughter. Though Irene would later go on and make history as an international beauty ambassador, aged 96, her beauty provided no advantage as a newly arrived black woman in Britain. I came over here in 57, 1957, because my daughter came here in 52 to do nursing. Unfortunately, she couldn't get carried through with she had rheumatic fever. Fortunately, she met a man and she got married. And within a year, she had the first child. That's the reason I came over, to give her a hand. Because in those days, you have to have a home of your own. Or it's very difficult when you 
want to have somewhere to live. They don't want you or they can't have you, which you say. So I came over in 1957, September, <laughs> my birthday. And I stayed, of course. I was very unhappy. A cold, I can't tell you how many pieces of garment I used to sleep on and how many blankets, and I wish the morning wouldn't come because I'm looking after the daughter and her husband going to work, and I'm looking after, so I have to get up. After decades as a mother, grandmother, and great-grandmother, it would be a chance conversation with the warden at the nursing home in which she still lives that would catapult Irene Sinclair to fame and secure her place as a standard bearer to many of her generation and background. I said, well, I'd be my guest. There is a woman who wants to build up a cosmetic form, and she's looking for people, old people in their late 70s or 80s. I said, well, you know how old I am. I do know. But she doesn't know, and she doesn't know what you look like. And she would like to come to visit you. However, he said to her, I do not have 70, late 70 or 80s. I do have, but it wouldn't fit the bill. I didn't know that at the time. I have one, 96. She said, I think I want a decrepit old woman. I am trying to tell you I'm, being, being, I'm about to build a business. I borrowed money from my mother, <laughs> and she's building this thing. And Dove so kindly asked her to get someone. Not Dove, the cosmetic form, I didn't know. He said, come and see for yourself. Reluctantly, oh, I said, no, I don't like to be center of attraction. I like to be noticed. Okay. Oh, they mightn't take you, but other places. But do me the favor, because I want to see, she told me about the decrepit old woman, I want her to see. <laughs> So reluctantly, I agreed. But to understand the story of black people in Britain is to understand the transatlantic slave trade and its roots in the UK, a story that goes back even further than Irene's 108 years. Eric Lynch is a lifelong Liverpudlian with deep roots in the Caribbean, Barbados to be precise. He's one of a growing band of historians keen to tell the unfiltered story of the UK's tempestuous relationship with its colonies. But when the slaves came to Britain, they were already broken in. Yes. You would have a plantation owner, uh, we'll use Barbados, mm -hmm. plantation owner, he's been out to Barbados before, he has a landlord there, a manager looking after the plantation for him. He's back in England with his wife and children. He gets the equivalent of a letter saying that he's needed out there. Mm -hmm. So he says to his good lady wife, well, I'm off to Barbara. She says, hang on a minute. You went there last time, last year by yourself. This time I'm coming with you. And when the two kids say, oh, we're coming as well. When they arrive at the plantation, here is the plantation manager. He's got all these slaves lined up. For your good lady, take this young woman. She's a servant. For yourself, take this young man. And for your little girl, here's a little girl. And for your little boy, here's a little boy. Within five minutes of taking control of these children and the adults, they give them stupid, ridiculous sounding names. This is done deliberately, so that when people hear their names, people will laugh. This is done deliberately to make them figures of fun, to rob them of their dignity. Eventually, it's time for the plantation manager to come back. So he says to his good lady wife, you know, I've become quite fond of my manservant, Prince Charles. I think I'll take him back. 
She says, yes, I've become quite a friend of my maid, Jemima. And the two kids say, can we have ours? And that's how slaves came back to Britain, already broken in. There are direct links between past injustices and present issues surrounding race and inequality in Britain. Now, there are a lot of people who think the black experience started with the Windrush. You know for a fact that that's not the case. Not, not true, not true. It is, it is a fact that even on the slave ships, there were black men. They may have been slaves, but they were working as seamen on the ships, right? And to give you a typical example, if you go into the history of black people in Liverpool, they, many of them that can trace their ancestors quite far back. Uh, give you a, a good example. My grandfather, whose name was Felix Augustus Scott, who was born in Christchurch in Barbados, he arrived in this city as a boy of approximately 11 years of age in the early 1800s. He arrives on a ship of sail. Now where he docked, we do not know. But we do know that he ran away from the ship. He joined the fairground, became a boxer, was a well-known boxer in Liverpool in the fairgrounds. Yes. So it, there's people can trace the history, the family back to plantations in the Caribbean and also in Africa. Liverpool, a city literally built on the blood, sweat and resources of enslaved people, seemed the perfect location for a museum celebrating and marking the UK's slave past. Dr. Richard Benjamin is head of the International Slavery Museum. Well, there's many cities in this country that profited from the enslavement of Africans. You know, Liverpool is is one of those cities. Now Liverpool kind of took it to another level. It wasn't the first city in this country to embark on enslaving Africans. London and Bristol would be fine. But Liverpool took it to another level, mid 18th century to the early part of the 19th century. There's lots of figures that the experts band around, but more than one million enslaved Africans were taken on Liverpool ships from Africa, stolen from Africa, taken to the Americas. People made fortunes on that. And you can see that in the physical landscape of, of Liverpool. So what we try to do as a museum is say to people, look, you know, in, not just in Liverpool, but because we're here, you know, look outside the window of the museum, you see the dry docks, and that's where slaver ships were fitted out. Equally, that's just in front of one of the main shopping centres of Liverpool. Do you know? So if you've just come to Liverpool for the day, and it's a great place to go for the day, there's nothing wrong with doing that, but equally we want to make people aware of the landscape that you're in. And not everybody, but a lot of people in this city made their fortunes on the back of enslaving individuals and I think that's an important point we have to get across. Social cohesion and integration have always driven communities forward but there was often a heavy price to pay for those who seem to be crossing the colour line. It is very slow because you've got to understand the, the way in which white women were castigated as regards if they married a black man. You had a situation in this city where if a young black boy was walking along the street with a young white woman, young black girl, a white girl, a policewoman would stop them. And the policewoman would ask the girl, what's she doing? What are you doing with him? Where do you live? Yeah, this was harassment. And you've only got to go to the libraries, get the old newspapers out, and look at the things that they said about white women who were married to black men. They were prostitutes. This is the way in which they castigated them. Look at the language which they used as regards the children who were born. Half caste, yeah, high yellows. It's absolutely disgusting. And if there were any doubt that ugly racism in Britain wasn't just a thing of the distant past, 
The museum in Liverpool has an educational section named in memory of Anthony Walker, who sadly was proof that this hate still exists. Anthony Walker, young black man, you know, his life ahead of him, was walking with his white girlfriend in a part of Merseyside, just outside of Liverpool. And because of that, he was murdered. He got an axe in his head for doing that. So that's not acceptable. It's not acceptable to me, and it's not acceptable in my view for you know, a forward-thinking democratic society. His family live in Liverpool, so we worked with the family. We said, look, we don't want people to forget what happened to Anthony, but equally, we want to work with you, because there's the Anthony Walker Foundation, which exists, and we want to help your, uh, the work that you do, and to, to work with young people, to work with people who may have been victims of hate crime. Resistance didn't stop at love. It was even a problem in war. Despite the shared sacrifices made in battle, including by men like Eric's father, who was a stoker in the Navy during World War I, even the desire to fight for king and country was not met without the spectre of prejudice. In the First World War, when the war broke out in the Caribbean islands, and I'm talking about what I know, Barbados. There were black men in Barbados who had been educated that this is the mother country. And so they wanted to go and fight for the mother country. The plantation owners and the white government of Barbados did not want them men to be trained as soldiers. We can't have them if they're using rifles. Right. So it was no. Some of the men got together and they wrote letters to the King of England. Now, previous to this, members in the War Office knew that these black men wanted to go, but they didn't want them. When the King of England received these letters, he called for a meeting for members of the War Office, and he insisted that they had to go and fight. And so they were conscripted now, they met, them men thought they were going to go and be trained with rifles and be on the front line, killing Germans. They were not. They were put in what was called the Pioneer Corps. They had no rifles. They were carrying ammunition and supplies to the front line in the trenches, giving out the ammunition. They never took part in it. Now, some of them were actually put, I think it was in Egypt, there was a big hotel where German officers were put, captured. These black soldiers were put there as skivvies to clean the bathrooms, clean the toilets, and look after the German soldiers. So they were lower than the enemy? That's right. Black history is an ever-moving path, and one of its trailblazers is Jamaican-born Reverend Rose Hudson Wilkin. She made history by being appointed as chaplain to the Queen and chaplain to the Speaker of the House of Commons, the first black person to hold both those positions. Reverend Hudson Wilkins, we're in such an exalted environment. Do you think about the little girl in Jamaica who had that calling to the ministry? I do often because uh, that little girl is still there. <laughs> um, I was 14 years old when I felt an overwhelming sense of being called to ministry. And uh, it's never left me and it is still there. That call is still there. So whatever obstacles that I face, I just have to be reminded why I am, I am there and that sees me through it all. As a young lady in Jamaica, did you think about Britain and what it might be like before you came over in 82 to settle into train? Well, my mother came to England when I was a baby and I was left behind with my older sister. And so England had always been there 
somewhere in the back of my mind. My mother was there. A whole family had grown up here, so to speak. Um, but it never occurred to me that I would one day be here. And uh, um, when I left school, I worked for a year and then applied for full-time lay ministry because women were not allowed then to be ordained. And, uh, and of course, we were trained for that particular ministry. We were then trained here in London. And so I made my first venture to the United Kingdom when I was 18 years old. Those early days in the UK shaped the experiences of many of the newly arrived. Professor John's first impressions of the UK came back to him as if it were yesterday. Yes, absolutely. 20th of August, 1964, off a BOAC airline, British Overseas Airways Corporation. I remember it well. Heathrow Airport. And coming off there and my mother and my brother um, coming to, to pick me up in a, 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 um, a spanking Austin, Cambridge, um, um, full of chrome and well-polished and things. Uh, and I remembered how vast everything was as compared to Grenada. The roads were wide, um, the buildings were large. I couldn't understand what these funny things sticking up on the top of the buildings were. Um, not a lot of smoke coming out of them in the middle of August. Uh, and then people explained that they were chimneys and, and so on and so forth. I, I thought England had the ugliest buildings on earth. Um, and it took, me some <laughs> it took me some time to get used to the architecture of, of London. It wasn't what I expected. It all seemed gray, very gray. The houses were not as beautiful as the houses that I knew in Jamaica. Um, in Jamaica, the houses looked very different and everyone had their own unique uh, uh, colors or, you know, it was all the same and it had these chimneys. So I immediately thought that they were um, uh, factories. <laughs> and, and then I stayed in, in Victoria, actually, for a few days before the college was open. And I noticed that people were running. And I'm thinking, I can't see a fire. Why are they running? And I actually asked someone if there was a fire. And they said, no, no, we're running to get the train. And I thought, how weird. In Jamaica, the trains wait for you. <laughs> when we did have them anyway. So it was all very different. And it took some getting used to. Despite the difficulties settling in had brought new arrivals to Britain, a return to the islands was out of the question for most of them. From the moment I arrived, I had a nostalgia for the Caribbean. I found the place cold, not just in terms of weather, temperature, but, but uh, the way people communicated with one another. Um, uh, and generally speaking, it, it, it seemed to me that... Um, uh, there were a whole range of codes of behavior one needed to learn if you were going to get through daily living in, 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 in this country. And by and by, uh, you learned from others around you and what they did, how they adapted to situations. Um, and you brought yourself to many situations too. Irene has seen the changing face of Britain she survived its ebb and flow and has a message for those following in her slipstream. What's your advice for the younger people now? Oh, the young ones, just, just don't give up. Don't say never. That an impossibility might present itself. It's very difficult, as it was for me in midlife. But don't give up. It rains today, it does not always rain tomorrow. You have times when the garden is beautiful, there are times. So you have good days, you have to accept it. And then you have bad days. So just don't say never. Keep on going on. 
if you fail today, you would hardly fail to determination. And do not say, I would never, I can. Would you're sitting there to be honest? Please answer honestly. Did you ever think that I would ask someone at 96 to be a model? No, uh, thank you. The highest they would ask is 30, 40, and modeling clothes, and so you go on a little longer. But you're quite right. So how can I say never? <laughs> it was done to me. Well, as I keep telling myself, I seem to forget my age. And I must be forgetful. I must be weak. I must be hard of hearing, losing my sight. Because as I say, I do not know anyone a hundred, let alone a hundred and seven. Life goes by. And all because I always with ever not not never. Despite decades of settlement of people from the old empire, Britain can still feel like a foreign land for those with a heritage outside the white cliffs of Dover. For people of color in Britain, the odds are still stacked against them in everything from crime and policing through to the criminal justice system, education and beyond. Recent national flashpoints like the murder of Stephen Lawrence at the hands of racists in Eltham, London, and the subsequent failure of the police in dealing with his killers, to the shooting death of Tottenham man Mark Duggan and the riots that followed. Being British was a very complicated affair, with race still very much on the agenda. For historian Tony Warner, conversations around race and equality in Britain can feel very much like déjà vu. As the founder of a company that provides historical tours of London, highlighting places significant to the black experience, he's well placed to fill in some of the gaps in black British history, including the story of the man who became the first black man to sit in the House of Lords, Sir Larry Constantine. And in the 1940s, he was as famous then as Usain Bolt is now. And during the 40s, of course, World War II was on, and um, Larry Constantine was employed by the British government to look after the welfare of the thousands of African Caribbean people who have left the Caribbean to come to help um, fight the war in England. Um, as a person who traveled a lot, he'd often protect himself by asking if it was okay for him to stay in a certain hotel, and by the way, I'm black guy. So he'd actually bring- Well, why did he have to say, but I'm black, by the way. Do because not be alarmed. It was, it was typical to be refused accommodation as a black person. And when it came to private homes or hotels, so to avoid that problem, he'd actually ring in advance and say, I'd like to book an hotel. And by the way, I'm a black guy. Is that cool? So that's what he did. So he booked into the Imperial Hotel. The one, one Yeah, over the one there. that's on that site there yeah. now. And he'd come, to, come there with his uh, wife and daughter. And he was going to supposed to stay for four nights. But when he got there, he was told he couldn't stay there because he was black. So he called his manager, who was a white guy, came down to discuss the issue with the, the hotel. And the hotel told the manager the same thing, that he could not stay in that hotel because he was an NIGGR and the white American troops who were staying there wouldn't like it. Therefore, he was forced to go to a hotel around the corner from the Imperial Hotel. So, of course, that is very embarrassing for him, being a big star here, helping the war effort, fighting for Britain, basically, and then being refused accommodation. So he actually sued the hotel. Although at this time, there's no laws against risk discrimination. So he actually sued Hotel for breach of contract and he won his case. So he becomes the, a, a part of the kind of the civil rights movement in this country. He actually successfully sues this hotel for risk discrimination. And that sets a kind of a, a trend across the entire nation that you can actually win your case for discrimination in England. And it then also inspires other people to do the same sort of thing. So it's a major landmark, but most people don't know about Leary Constantine or the hotel or where it is or anything about that. Sir Larry Constantine was not alone in those early days. Before him in the 1930s, a Jamaican studying medicine in London, Harold Moody, 
formed the first notable civil rights organization, the League of Colored Peoples. It was at this location in central London where Dr. Harold Moody held some of his most important meetings. Why was a civil rights organization necessary at that period? Because in 1930s Britain, black people were blocked from getting decent jobs or jobs full stop. They were blocked from getting um, a good education. But also, they, there was a colour bar in the military. So one of the things Harold Moody was campaigning for was an end to the colour bar because as a black person, you are allowed to become an officer. So this is a, another issue you campaigned against. He also campaigned for the, the proper care of mixed race children because during the war years, there were lots of black, black personnel from America based here. They had relations with local white women and they had mixed race children. But because they were mixed race, they were often then um, given up for adoption. So he, Harold Mooney and one of the group was trying to actually find places to look after these mixed race chil children who've been abandoned because of the, the color of their skin. And that was a big issue at the time. It's been forgotten now, but it's a big issue at the time. Privileges many enjoy in the UK were hard fought for by people like Billy Strachan, Claudia Jones, and Dame Jocelyn Barrow. Yet these are not names that immediately roll from the lips of most Britons. Why is it that young people in schools aren't necessarily aware of seminal moments like this, of the individuals that you're talking about? Well, it's really weird because you find that in English schools, we are taught about American black history. So we're literally taught chapter and verse about Luther King, Rosa Parks, and the bus boycott in Alabama in 1955. We're not taught anything about the bus boycott in Bristol in 1963. Um, and that can't be an accident. It can't be an accident that people like Larry Constant left out of the curriculum. And it seems to be like there's a, a drive to, to show that racism occurred in America and they had problems over in America, but there's nothing to, to like that here. And that's of course not true, but that's the impression you would get from looking at the curriculum in that it doesn't teach you about what happened in this country from the 30s to the 60s, it concentrates on what happened in America, uh, as if to say the problem was over there, not over here. For Lem Sise, the poet, writer, and our chancellor at the University of Manchester, the British brand of racism was insidious and got its claws into all areas of life. It served as a barrier to not only success, but to fully experiencing aspects of growing up that white counterparts may never have had to consider. It's, it's kind of easy to patronize the past to forego our responsibilities in the present. I was told under no uncertain terms by being stopped by the police in my car every week, every two weeks, once every two weeks, for a year this happened, and longer, that that wasn't somewhere that I should be. Who was I to be driving? I wanted to go to clubs. Now, the bouncers in the clubs of Manchester at the time, they didn't like too many of these people like me. Okay, so there was that uh, close girls. Right, if I went out with a white girl, uh, that was, that, hey, that's not for me. What I'm trying to say is that all of the rites of passage to go into adulthood were guarded by gatekeepers who would use racism as the primary uh, weapon without even realizing it themselves. The point is, is that all of those natural places that you're born to shine in, to shine into adulthood, to shine into education, were guarded by a group of um, individuals unconnected to each other other than by one thing, a general distrust of who I was going to become. This uh, society has a fear of the black man. It's been around for a long, long time and it's deep-seated. We will steal their women, we will, we will overbear, we will cause trouble. We will mug, we will fight, we will be aggressive. And I saw this on a micro level in my own life, growing up in a white community. Gallery boss Joss Bryant is at the forefront of the British artistic movement, using his art connections both in Britain and in Africa to forge new paths. But even this knowledge 
has not prevented his feeling, sometimes under the cultural microscope. Every time I travel, and it's pretty much often this has happened, every time I come back to the UK, I've been stopped at customs, and I'm a British-born citizen, stopped at customs, with no reason, okay, you can call it random, but it happens a lot to me. So that sort of entry point is always, I bet something's gonna happen. When I get off the plane, when I'm coming down the steps of a plane or down the slope, whatever, that's in the back of my mind. Nothing's ever gonna be found on me, I'm not that kind of a person, but the fact is that I must have a, a face or a walk or a look or whatever it might be. So I'm always aware that I am not white when I, when I reach Heathrow, Gatwick, wherever I might be, which I never ever experience when I go back to Ghana. As I say, I just blend in. So racism in Britain now has a different face, almost. It, it does. It, it, I More mean, people are in the firing line? Or? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, when I grew up, I remember it being the, the no blacks, no dogs, no Irish, that kind of slogan. Um, and then obviously we had the, that boom when it was all about Asians. And then it's got kind of took the, uh, the heat off of the black people for a little while. And then, of course, we had the riots and so on and so forth. And that all sort of highlighted again. Uh, but now we're coming to a different place now where you don't have to be a person of colour. You're, you're white until you open your mouth. And then all of a sudden you're not accepted. So that's kind of a different dynamic that I haven't been party to. But somebody who comes from East Europe has told me that that, that has actually happened to them. I don't think that racism is only by white people. I think black people are racist. I've traveled all over the world. I've seen it in my own community in Ethiopia and Eritrea. I've seen it in the Gambia to the Senegalese and vice versa. I have seen racism and I do believe that it is in every community. So I, this isn't a black white thing for me. Yeah. But in particular in this country, um, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's prevalent. Despite the hurdles and the obstacles, it seems the former colonies were very good at sending some of their most talented people. As a 10-year-old from Guyana, Sherry Ann Dixon, who became one of the UK's most well-respected makeup artists and writers on beauty, culture and identity, contributing to some of the industry's most well-known publications. I always had a vision that I was going to grow up and be somebody in England and I, I, I was told by my sisters that I told my grandfather that, you know, I'm going to be somebody, I'm going to be somebody. And I don't actually know what the somebody would have been, but apparently that's what I said to them. The path ahead was still unclear on that overcast day in May when a young Sherry Ann Bollers arrived on the BOAC aircraft to live with her aunt and uncle. On that train, which was quite exciting, I remember the train being exciting, coming in from Heathrow, and my head was spinning from side to side because I really wanted to take in everything I think I thought I was on the way to um, a place where there was going to be gold line streets. I always remember that because they always said Britain is the place where the streets were lined with gold and honey. You sort of had honey. And I sort of, I'm sure as a child, thought that somewhere on the way to going home that I would see something royal. I remember that. and. Um, I remembered my uncle giving me a coat and even the coat seems I was still cold in it. And we arrived at um, Clapham North because we lived in um, Chelsham Road in Clapham. Writing in Vogue, appearing on the BBC and doing the makeup for luminaries like Maya Angelou and Nelson Mandela. Dixon was able to play a big part in changing the perception of black women in the mainstream. I always wrote what I felt, uh, especially when I got into editorial. I would write, um, if, if I look back on the article in Cosmo Bella, it was always about 
it would be a basic article and then I'd get into it about, well, black women also have good skin and we don't all have um, oily skin or we, our skin is not thicker and I would try to change the misconceptions of what they thought about uh, a black person's skin, our hair um, being wiry and like, like steel wood, they would sort of talk about it like that. I would change the concept. Later on, I, I changed my hair but well, I went through quite a few different hairstyles, but I went for uh, locks, I started to twist. And I remembered when Morris, Root, Morris Aberdeen of Morris Root said, Sherry's locks in at the back, she, what would you want to do? And I said, leave it, and locks, decided to locks. And that, was, that one was quite hard, because although I was fighting, because I'm now going to events where people, like I remember the editor of Vogue at the time, and she, she and I got on, and I remember she looked at me and kept on looking at me, and she didn't even say, you've got a different hairstyle. She just decided not to speak to me again, because they saw that as radical. Like that? that. Pretty, just like that. I was a radical um, without even realizing that I was. It's only now that I look back on my life, I realized that it, all throughout my life, even the first job that I had, I, um, I lost that job indirectly because I had to make a decision and the decision was to put back your hair straight or keep it as an afro. The afro came about because of um, Angela Davis. It was the Soldat Brothers, the Black and Proud days and we were now learning about our brothers and sisters, the struggle that was happening in the United States. As Sherry Dixon sits amongst the exhibits at the Black Cultural Archives in Brixton, the historical heart of the black community in London, she remains a very proud Brit, but one who will shout her Caribbean connections to the rafters. I'm beginning to think that I worked hard, I, I might have worked hard at keeping the Caribbean going because um, Quite often people think that as you move up the ladder that you have to lose your Caribbean um, dialect or that you can't say a little patois or something. I don't see why, because the man that comes from Scotland will refer to something Scottish or Welsh or wherever. He would say that, and, or French, and nobody ever um, says, nobody judges that person. They actually embrace it. I remember, um, one publisher that used to talk about uh, uh, one of the girls being um, Spanish or something, and he would say, oh, she's got that fieriness of, the, of, of being um, Italian or Spanish, I can't remember what she is. Well, hello, I'm Caribbean, I've got that fieriness as well. It's just that we, we had to keep it subdued because we were from a different time frame, you know, we were coming from slavery time frame. But I was fiery as well, so, I made a point of, even in my profile, in saying Guyanese. I, 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 I say it, I say, it says Guyanese award winning, and when I speak I tell people I'm from Guyana. Um, so it's in print. It's, it's giving back to the country of birth, although I embrace the country that I live in, and quite often when I speak, and, and I'm a public speaker now, and I speak and I bring out that Guyanese dialect or I'll remind people about things auntie or whoever used to say. So watch your mouth, girl. <laughs> As many descendants of the generation that came after World War II, having a foot in both cultures was almost a prerequisite, even if embracing this dual reality took time. Well, as I said, I'm born in Britain, so I don't know another way to live. Uh, I was raised in this country, and this is a way that um, I, I adopted the British way of life. But in the house, my, both my parents um, spoke Fanti, the local dialect. Um, so we, we always had that connection with the fact that, you know, we are British, but we, we also have another storyline within us. Um, and when we go back to Ghana, we feel very comfortable in the fact that you know we're, we are home, we feel like we're home, we, we don't feel like we're on holiday. You know, we have a home, we, we settle down, we just get on with life the same way we would do when we come home. Do you think that's a new thing for maybe your generation? I think it's, it's, it's happening a lot more now, you know. Um, people are now looking at their identity, uh, whereas beforehand, um, if I go back to my school years, 
Um, it wasn't the coolest thing to be called an African. And we used to tell people um, we're from Ghana, but they would mis either misunderstand it or not realize that there is a Ghana and a Guyana. Uh, so when people used to say Guyana, we would just say yes, because it was easier for us. Um, it wasn't the coolest thing to be African when I was a child. It wasn't the thing that you wanted to sort of associate yourself with. It was okay in your circle, or my, my parents' friends, and within their, their siblings and, and, and their children and so on. That was fine, we, we would all be the same. But when you're sort of spreading out to a wider audience, and I must say in some instances it was, was Caribbean guys that would not sort of um, accept the fact that we were all, all one, and there was that distinctive line that, you know, we're, we're, we're West Indian and you're not. But now I think you'll find a lot more people, uh, certainly of my, my sort of generation, have started to realise that there is another uh, storyline that needs to be told, and they're, they're looking into their ancestry a lot more, which I, I champion. With black heroes emerging every day, there's still worries about how inequality and race rear their ugly heads in Britain. Lem has a position on challenging that aspect of life for many Britons. What I wanted to say about racism is that, uh, you know, uh, we are not defined by it. And that actually, you know, the beauty of, of having such a formidable uh, enemy is that you have to find your inner resources, uh, find out who you are so that you can, uh, you can fight it into invisibility. I, I am sure there were changes for the better, but at the moment sometimes I wonder if we're going right back around in a circle again because I don't understand why we're discussing colour. I still don't understand colourism. And it's not colourism or prejudice from the point of view of um, black on white, it's black on black. That confuses me, because I, I, I'm, I'm going to be 63 soon, and I, I'm talking about 11. We started talking from when I was 9 or 10 years old to now being 63. I would have hope that we're not talking about colorism, that we're not talking about straight hair, that we're not saying we like girls that look a certain way. Um, I would have thought with all the education that we have, using the source of different medias that we've got now, that we would be at ease with ourselves, that no, we wouldn't be talking about somebody's size or somebody's nose, or you wouldn't be talking about a shade of color. Um, or you wouldn't be using certain words that start with N because we would be educated enough to know that that wasn't a nice word that was used in the days of slavery. You there should be educated enough to know what we've gone through and not be derogatory towards each other and embrace all shades and all nationalities. We should be more educated. The black British journey is an ever-marching, evolving, shifting sand. Despite the challenges and sacrifices of those who made the journey to the old empire, or were born and raised here with a unique duality, it was always about striving, pushing on and doing better. One generation makes waves for the next. Joss and his family's experiences speak for tens of thousands who think maybe, just maybe, it might have been worth it. Well, I mean, my par both parents were academics, so they, it was encouraged um, back in the 60s to come to the UK and so on. Um, education um, was here. Um, they were able to put themselves through um, school and, and so on. So for them, it was always a journey to, to make a better life for the family. That was paramount. But they always, always had it in the back of their minds that they wouldn't stay. They always had that view in of going home. Um, I use the word home again. Um, unfortunately, my father died here in the UK. And probably out of the two of them, my father was quite Western. He, 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 he was very political um, and he thought his best work would be done here. My mum was a bit more adventurous, 
and she did what she did to raise the family. She took early retirement, went back to Ghana, and then she started trying to do this sort of six months in, six months out. So a lot of time, a lot of her latter years, we were missing mum because she was there building the home and just preparing the way for us, basically. So it's a shame they're both not here right now, but I know they'll be like shining down on us now and saying, look, guys, you've, you've done it, you know? And that really means a lot to me. That was the dream. That was the vision. That's the vision. My mum always wanted us to do something that well, we, we always wanted to do something that made our parents proud, always. You know, and, well, we're almost there. Almost. Almost, yeah. Battle scarred, bruised, but not bowed, Britain's black community continues to make inroads in both asserting their right to be considered a part of a country they've contributed to with blood, sweat and tears, and redefining what it can mean to straddle multicultural identities. For many Brits born outside the shadows of Big Ben, there remains a steadfast resistance to complete assimilation. Trailblazers like Eva Tarr Kirkhope, who founded the London Latin American Film Festival alongside her late husband after spending her formative years in Cuba. The shock of Britain from the sunshine of the Caribbean was a familiar tale. It was amazing because the first impression was that there was a total obscurity. It was like two o'clock in the afternoon or something and it was dark. And then it was grey. The, the sooner the, 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 um, the plane was descending, descending in this horror film of <laughs> complete, <laughs> complete darkness. Like many who would come after her, Eva's ability to see Britishness and the story of black people in the UK through more than one lens has set the scene. Her work with the film festival and how it aids integration and understanding. Did you think about being a pioneer for Latin and British integration at that time? I think so. I think, and um, um, I didn't do it um, per se. I just did it because I wanted to show that kind of uh, difference, and also to to show that it, it was it was uh, interesting and, and vibrant and all that. But and in, at the same time. I, I push, push, push to the limits. And, and now look how integrated it is. And the cinema, how many of the festivals there are. You have the Argentinian festival, the Colombian festival, I mean, the Brazilian festival. So the, we are competing, but I like this, com this competition because it's, uh, it's fresh and it's good. I, I find it fantastic. I find it very, very, um, uh, open and I, I like that diversity and then because I mean um, you also have the possibilities of knowing all the cultures. Chrissa Amwa of Amwa Designs embodies the new spirit, what it means to be British and other. This renewed sense of duality is something today's black Brits are more at ease with. My family is from Ghana, although there is heritage there also from Benin and Togo, but it's Ghana where my most immediate family live um, and reside. And so I get to travel there very often. And every time that I was going, you know, Africa's been celebrated as the last frontier. And each time I went, I would see, oh, wow, this is, oh, there's a shopping mall here. Oh, there's a new store here and etc. And it seemed that our, the country's development or the culture was heading towards a very Western template of success if you like and uh, the more I learnt about the heritage and the culture of Ghana which is so diverse there are so many different um, cultural and ethnic groups that you can't just in a way although there's a similarity that you know applies to all there are so many 
differences that are each very unique and very exciting to learn about. And I was learning more and more and thought, actually, we've there's a culture here that should be really celebrated. And not to say that it's been diluted at all, but I just thought that there was more to shout out about. Having a foot in each culture is not something this bold new global Brit generation actively considers. It could be seen as an act of resistance against the old norms when assimilation was everything, where members of obvious ethnic minorities could be British, well, or never both coexisting without obvious conflict. It's conscious and subconscious actually, it's something that as a child of parents who came to the UK 35 or so years ago to create a new life here and having had a family here, we I guess you could say we were raised with a sense of duality. So at no point, and I think anybody that meets me now very quickly soon learns that my family's from Ghana, um, very proud of that fact. I think when you go home and, you know, dinner is an option between either pizza and salad or banku and okro soup, there is that sense of duality. So your feet are naturally in both environments. Also, when you go back to Ghana, you do realise the Britishness, if you like, of your upbringing or who you are as a person. And there's no getting away from that. So actually, why not embrace the two? Um, there's no conflict for me at all. I very much see myself as a daughter of Ghana, as a daughter of Africa, but also I'm very British as well. The generational difference in this approach to life in the UK can be most stark when parents who may have come to the UK as immigrants remain to raise families who see Britain as their home. Marketing and promotions guru Darren Dixon considered himself British first and foremost, and that sense of accepted duality came later. Being first generation, do you ever think about the significance of what that means? You're the first person in your family to be born and raised in this country. Now I'm a little bit older, I do think of that. Uh, but I think when I was younger, I didn't. I'm, you know, this London is my town. This is where we are, we're fully integrated. It's only until I actually, you know, sit down with my mum or dad and think about the struggles that they had or more so even the struggles my grandmother and granddad had. And I feel very fortunate, but then it actually did drive me on even more to, to succeed. So I'm very much a Londoner, very, very much a Londoner, South Londoner. So, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I get it. And obviously growing up, you know, I had kids that were maybe bought... Uh, uh, other friends that were born in Jamaica or born in Nigeria or wherever, and then they would call that their place home. They would call Jamaica home or they'd call Trinidad home or they'd call India home. And then I'm like, well, I, I, I'm born here in South London, you know? And you felt a little bit like a little bit lost or a little bit like you don't have the right or the identity. And the very few racist times that I've, the racism that I've encountered um, where people say go back home or things like that. It does hurt and then you start thinking, well, they said go back home, am I not from here? But that actually drove me to research where my family's from and why they said those things. And my parents were very good at helping me understand why, the, hey, you belong here, but this is why they said that. Vegan cook and media professional Susan Kirlu understands this new concept of belonging to more than one place perfectly. Born in the UK to Jamaican parents, the family moved to the Caribbean for five years. Like many with family connections in the old empire, moving comfortably between these spaces comes naturally. Somebody says go back home, I'm not even, I just tune right out because I just think, you know what, the reason I'm here is because you destroyed a lot of things in my home and the opportunities that I should have in my home are not there because of things that other generations that look like you have done. So I'm not even listening to that. When I go back to Jamaica, sometimes people say, oh, English lady, you're English. And I say, you know what? I'm not English. Because if you look at me, you can see I'm not a native English person. That's quite obvious. And they say, yeah, but you were born in England. I said, yeah, Jesus was born in a stable. But that doesn't make him a horse. So. I am who I say I am, not who people tell me I am. So I have to be 
firm in my head who I am. And yes, it is a duality. There, there is a plural kind of thing there, but you get used to it. So you know how to, I know how to behave when I'm here and how to tune in and set my mind, so to speak, when I'm in England. And then when I'm in Jamaica, I don't consider that I'm the British person who's come home. I just think of myself as a Jamaican. Okay, they can pick up that I live in England, but I can drop the accent enough so it confuses them. The times, they are a-changing. An acceptance of minority culture by the mainstream is becoming more fashionable. I remember as a child, it not being maybe so cool to be African in the UK, but that is something that I think in later years, um, we've seen a turnaround, you know, be it through Afrobeat music and culture, or be it through art, African artists experiencing, you know, an amazing renaissance at the moment, as um, is African inspired design. Self-acceptance and a wider sense of equality can still be a way off. Um, yeah, I did go through a stage of wanting white hair, uh, white girl hair, and you know, I sometimes thought, well, is my nose too wide? Um, wouldn't I look nice with green eyes? Or and then that was in my teens, and then I kind of came to a stage when I thought, I'm fine being me. Most people I know are fine with me being me. There are some people who are not fine with me being me. And you meet those anywhere in the world, I suppose. But you have to be happy with who you are within yourself. This feeds into the idea that minority cultures are still viewed with suspicion and hostility, even now. I don't think Britain has a race problem. I know Britain has a race problem. Part of my degree is media and cultural studies and a couple of the models, modules um, are called studies in race and culture. And what I unfortunately learned is since the 50s, 40s, 50s to now, things haven't really changed as they should. They've got less obvious and they're kind of shuffled sideways. And the law has changed but the law can't change hearts and minds. And I can't change everyone's hearts and minds, so all I have to do is think, am I doing anything that's a racist thing? Am I being prejudiced about somebody because they don't look like me? And I have to keep bringing it back to myself. The only person's behavior I can change is my own. And I have to remember, as a Christian, we're all God's children, black, white, Jew, Greek, short, tall, fat, thin, and I really try to see that everyone is a person and there's only one race and that's a human race and there's no, it's only politics and ignorance that makes us want to be divided. But for me, it's one race, the human race. And Britain could do a lot more, a lot, lot more. It might be more difficult to be accepting of the slow pace of change when you faced direct prejudice. Artist Morris Thompson is proud of the artistic journey he's made from a young man living in the Midlands to the big smoke of London. But even his journey to the nation's capital held its own surprise. First day I came to London, I had um, set up a place to stay, and that was in Barking, East London. And um, got to the house and the woman wouldn't open the door. We'd called her, me and my friend, he was um, studying the same college he's done before photography. And um, got to the house, the woman wouldn't open the door. So knocked again, walked away, came back, saw the light on, she wouldn't open the door. And couldn't see her, but we saw, you know, the lights on, it was off before. So we went to the police station and I said, listen, I, have a place, had it all set up, come all the way to London, we start college the next day, and the woman went up in the door. They said, well, she hadn't committed a crime, so we just called her again. And in the end, I just stayed in the police station 
um, with my bags and slept there and the next day went into college and got set up with another place in Romford. Was this one of the first times you'd ever been presented with this kind of bigotry or was this something that wasn't new to you? I never expected it. It was a shock because um, the woman was fine on the phone with us um, and, you know, I'd never been anywhere trying to get in a place and experience that. I've heard of it. My parents would tell me certain things, um, but I've never experienced that type of racism. But I've experienced um, blatant racism in other ways, definitely. Had Morris checked in with Eva, he would have been reminded that though the incidents were decades apart, those who oppose equality in the UK have done so with a frightening level of consistency. It only takes something like Brexit to reignite some of those painful memories. I could not believe that um, this Brexit will have this, uh, this um, side. I mean, I, I was used to, to how it was. I mean, now, things, things to me, they are getting us it was in 79. Oh my God, I, I can't believe that. It's getting, because I mean, I remember when we first came here, there were places that we, we didn't have to, where to live, uh, uh, my first husband and myself. And we were uh, looking for rooms to let, and there was, there was that, that thing that, uh, at the beginning we were together, and then after, a few refusal, I used to hide, so he went and he, he, went, he went along and then he negotiated and, um, so that they couldn't, they couldn't see me. The black British experience has not been a singular one. Within every smaller community will be those for whom the concept of identity, racism and struggle have been background noises, never quite at the forefront of their daily experience and I have got friends that have been stopped for nonsensical reasons. But I think it's about your upbringing. My, my parents have always been, speak to people in a certain way and you get that reaction back or know how to handle yourself in situations. If you get stopped by this police, get out of the car, speak in an eloquent way, make sure you know. Um, so I just, it hasn't affected me in the ways that I've heard. However, I'm not one of those blind people that lives in a bubble. I know what the problems are, and the problems are education, or from both sides. As Britain's new generations navigate the intersectionality of their lives in a country that still has a way to go in both its institutional and personal racism, geopolitics and domestic political tremors like Brexit have exposed another target. Meet Halimat Shode, writer and editor with entrepreneur Dalila Baruti, CEO of Hug My Hair. Two young women whose very public presence is usually enough to provoke strong reactions. I feel like I should feel that sense of um, almost like a burden, but I never see it as a burden, but I hear it talked about as a burden, especially for Muslim women with the veil and the headscarf and the various names and being a black woman and the different issues of race and being a woman, all these things about gender. But I think from a very early age, I realized my identity and I appreciated my identity. And only when I went out into the world and I experienced different things that I realized people had a problem with the identity, that it was marginalized. I'm somebody that was born Muslim and I've been wearing the headscarf for about seven years now. And people will still ask me if I'm a Muslim or what religion am I? Because for them, they've never come across or they've never interacted or they're just generally ignorant about the wide race, wide, wide range of races in Islam. And so being a black Muslim woman, I think being in university was my turning point in realizing my identity and how complex and how marginalized it is. And it was from that point, especially being an English student, that I said to myself, First, I want to see myself in my writing. And then whatever platform or whatever industry I want to get into, I want to see myself there. And that will be my race and you'll see my headscarf along with it. So that's my race and my faith. And so those are always parts, those parts are always with me. That's, that is my identity. 
Tanzanian-born natural hair businesswoman Dalila shares a story that is both different but eerily familiar. Early days of feeling different. I was quite oblivious and naive as a young person. So any in times I felt different was because someone pointed it out. So it would be like, oh, your hair feels like cotton. Or um, someone pointing out 10 years after I left primary school that I was, I was one of the only three black people there. I didn't even notice and the other two were twins. So it's very much other people pointing it out and making me become conscious of it now. So when I'm walking around, I'm conscious that other people are seeing what these other people have said they see. Um, I went swimming with my sister once when we were two young girls and there were these girls inside who were also taking showers at the same time as us. And they said very loudly, but again, I didn't hear. There's no point scrubbing, it won't wash off. And these are things that I don't know if I've consciously built up a block to or if I've just been oblivious naturally and now the veils are starting to come down. If I was to explain it from my experience, more of my experience has been a lot more positive than negative. So I wouldn't even highlight the race issue if I was trying to explain Britain to someone. I think what's happened recently with Brexit, for example, has made it a lot more obvious to the rest of the world how maybe how much we suppressed our intolerance for others, for other people, people who are other. And it's almost given people a license to be openly expressive about how they feel, so much so that they're telling people to leave in the streets. Even though they might have seen a different Britain based in the media, I'd still encourage them to come here and experience it for themselves. Because I know so many people that love being here, especially in the diverse areas like London. It's so diverse. You're sitting on a train and there's so many different cultures around you. And I only ever feel like I stand out or isolated when I start to move outside of London um, into the country. I was with someone once, I think we were traveling, so we were stopping at a service station on the way and they pointed out, you're the only black person in here. I was like, great, thanks. I hadn't even noticed, but it just, it just tends to happen as you go further out. And I think a lot of the frustrations and prejudices stem from fear of the unknown and not putting yourself in the position where you can learn from that other person and get to know that other person on a human level and realise that actually what's outward isn't what matters, it's not who they are, you know? Whilst the fight for equality can take many forms, there are those who are happy to literally put their bodies on the line to be counted, with deaths in custody, incidents of official brutality and state-sanctioned prejudice still an issue, Halimat is happy to stand up and make a visible protest. We are the minority in the country, but we are still a part of the country, and this is affecting us. And if you don't care, we're gonna bring the issue to you, regardless of what your reaction is. And even as I left the protest, somebody walking past it just called out, saying that, you know, we have it better than even the white people in the country do. And I just thought, and I just laughed at him. I just thought that is so funny. And he, if you ask, if, you, if I was to ask that man about police brutality, he'd probably give me a blank stare and say, not in the UK, that doesn't happen here. And I found that a lot of um, British white people have said that quite often. And I posted a video on my Twitter page of footage from the protests. And I had a few responses of, this is very unnecessary, this is very stupid. And I thought that was enough for me to know that people don't care because if you care about something, you're going to listen to the issues that people are having and you're going to try and empathise. And I'm not saying that's all British white people, of course, there's quite a few in attendance and that are supporting the Black Lives Matter movement in general in the US and the UK. But it is about being empathetic to the issues that all of us are facing. And it might not be a class issue, it can be a race issue, it's a police brutality issue. These are various issues and they are affecting people in their day-to-day -day lives and people are dying because of it. Be it faith, art or pragmatism, today's black Brits have redefined what it means to simply exist in their own skin. In the Quran, it's, you know, there's, there's this um, principle in, in this faith that be in the world as if you're traveling. So don't really set up a home and get too comfortable because you have to prepare yourself for the next test, for the next challenge, for the next phase of your life. 
So that's very much how I view my business and what I'm going through is that it's very fluid and anything could happen being open to change and possibilities but in everything that I do trying to make that as positive as possible. There are many who lived, worked and died in Britain who would be shocked by the strides that have been made by subsequent generations. Generations who still acknowledge there is a long long way to go.